We're in the midst of a huge transformation where peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I am the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I am very excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Natasha Thomas. She is the Manager of People and Culture at Curate Partners. Natasha, it's good to see you. If you want to share a little bit about yourself for our listeners, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly it answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I'm very excited to be here. Um, My name is Natasha Thomas. I'm the Manager of People and Culture at Curate Partners. I have been in the recruiting HR field for a total of 10 years now, and prior to that, I was in retail sales. I do remember when people asked that question, and funny enough, I, like, when you just asked that, I, like, went back to a time, and I think it was maybe in, like, first or second grade, they asked that picture and you had to like draw a picture that went with it. And I said, I wanted to be an obstetrician. So I like drew a picture of like delivering a baby. So it's something that like, I vividly remember as like a childhood memory for some reason. I love that. It's always interesting to kind of think about where we would be 10, 20 years down the line. And when people asked us to do projects or asked the question of what do you want to be when you grow up? as well. Fast forward to today, can you tell me a little bit more about how has your personal journey really led you to be at Curate and really lead you to be in the people, talent, culture space? Absolutely. So I think early on, I guess, even like looking back to that as a child, I always knew I wanted to work with people and help people. I think my evolution of doing that has kind of changed over the decades of my life. I started working in retail sales when I was in sophomore in high school, I believe, and kind of worked my way through that in my like teens and early 20s. And then I thought about going my degrees in psychology. So I thought about then going back to school for mental health counseling. And funny enough, at the time, a friend was like, you should come work with me at my company. And I was like, okay, like, maybe let me think about it. I'm like going to school. And I, she at the time was working as an account executive at a IT staffing and services organization. So she invited me to come like meet with the team, talk with some people on our team and then start the interview process. And during that time, I kind of like realized I was like, oh, this could be a way for me to truly like work and impact people's lives in a different way than I had ever thought about it. Like you think about it, no one ever says I want to go to school to be a recruiter or it's just like people say sales, but there's not like recruiting one-on-one, one-on-one when you go to school. And I realized that there was so much to learn being in this industry and just to continue impacting others. So I went into that in 2010 and loved it. I loved that I was able to like help people like get jobs. I love that I was able to help people like professionally, like grow their careers. I love that I was actually able to just impact people's lives where maybe they didn't have like a savings before they were living paycheck to paycheck. And they had been able to like flourish their careers to the fact where they no longer had to worry about that. And they did have a savings. So all of those things really impacted me. And then I got the great opportunity to come to curate partners almost two years ago in October. And at the time I came on as the diversity business partner and our CEO and I really merged in our ideas of like where we saw the market going and where we saw a need. And I'm sure we all talk about DE&I and B now, but like, what does that really mean? And how can we truly like get involved in impact? And we were so parallel that it just seemed like the right move for me and the right organization. And with this organization, they're just really good about what do you want next in your career? What are you passionate about? And there was no one truly running HR in our organization. And we've been growing um, said fast for multiple years. This is, um, we just celebrated our eight year anniversary and we've had multiple years of being one of the fastest growing companies in Boston. So it seemed just kind of like a no brainer that I could have the opportunity to impact our internal staff as well as our external staff and making sure that they have a great experience working with us, but also keeping like at the core of what our company is about. And that's the people. 
Absolutely. You have an incredible opportunity to impact the lives of people, not only in their job and growth, which is really important, but also in their whole lives as people inside and outside of work. And that's what some that's something that a lot of folks are looking for in their career as well as people are thinking about um, kind of the role of work in their lives over the past few years. One study showed that 47% of employees reported that their stress was higher than anything they'd experienced uh, in their career before, but only 37% agreed their organization really understood what they needed, both in their personal lives and for their, their families. How would you answer kind of how you're showing up for the full lives of employees at uh, Carry Partners? I think the great thing about our organization is that with over a hundred years of industry experience with our co-founders and then with the individuals that are working with us day to day, we, the co-founders started the company being in this industry and knowing the stress that went with it. And they never wanted anyone working with us to experience that. So I think we see it with one of the things that like is steadfast is we have unlimited PTO and it's not about a lot of companies have unlimited PTO and people don't actually take the time or they're like, oh, I don't know if I should take this time. Is Am I going to be judged if I take a lot of time? And I think we are very like work hard, but then take the time to enjoy time with your family and your friends and don't be afraid to take a mental health day. And we look at, we have monthly lunches, which are DEI and B focused, and they are about mental health, financial health, like just overall, like self care. And how do we support the people that we're working with every single day? So I think for us, it's not just about like saying it, but also doing it. And I think that people see the leadership in our organization organizations taking the time to be with their families, taking the time to like do what they need for themselves and be in their children's lives or just be there for their friends or be there. Just sometimes you just need a day off and being able to say, I just need a mental health day. And it's okay to say that no one's like, oh my gosh, someone said that that's so weird. I think now a lot of organizations do take that into consideration and they are looking at the mental health and well-being of the individuals in the organization. But I think that I looked at, we were maybe a little bit ahead of our time with actually like being able to do that. And then also just really taking time as a team to spend time together. And I think that it allows people to be a little bit more themselves, people show up a little bit more authentic to work when they feel like they have that opportunity to share how they're feeling, what they're doing, and know that it's not something that's going to be like potentially held against them. I think that a lot of people don't come to work fully as themselves because they're afraid of what that backlash might be. And I think that I could feel very confident saying that I don't think that that's what we have in our culture. I think people are very comfortable like showing up as themselves, but also knowing that they have the support if needed and when needed from anyone in the organization, from, you know, the person who's directly leading them to our like CEO. And I think that that's something that's very different. It's like a great part about working with a smaller organization because you feel like you can talk to anyone and there's not this level of like hierarchy, but also you feel like everyone like does care. And I think that for me, that was one of the reasons that made me pick this organization is that in the beginning, I really felt like for my first conversations, I was like, wow, people like really care. And it's not just kind of like you're hearing them say it, but I can, I feel like I'm a pretty good judge of character and I could feel it from like my initial conversations. Yeah, you definitely want to feel it from those initial conversations. And you mentioned kind of celebrating the eight-year anniversary as well. And you want to continue to feel the, the values of the organization and also that people are authentically invested in you as an individual, uh, as well from managers and leaders. And people are really modeling that behavior if you say that you value flexibility and that and that time off. Are people taking that and are you having those transparent conversations as well, um, alignment between kind of those actions and the, the commitments from the team too. How do you think about ensuring folks feel like they really belong at Curie Partners from day one, day 90, year two and beyond? I know this has also been a conversation folks have been talking about of engaging and re-engaging uh, folks, especially as the company continues to be in, in a growth mode too. 
Right. Um, I think for us, one of like the first things we do is as soon as someone um, is onboarded, whether that's like them accepting our offer or we know they're going to be starting with our organizations, we send them a welcome, kind of a welcome case. And it's got like some swag of our company. It's got, you know, pens cup holders, all the things that you might need. And we send that both to our internal staff and our consultants that work for us as well. So anyone who joins our company gets kind of this welcome kit from us of everything that they need. Um, from an internal standpoint, when individuals are starting, we try to, if they're local, because we do have individuals that are um, 100% remote as well. We try to have them come in their first week so they get the opportunity to engage with the team to work with different people to get to meet the different parts of our organization because our co-founders are there our financial team is there our operations team is there as well as our account executives and recruiting consultants and everyone's in an open concept so it's you have people from all different parts of our business sitting together at any given day so you really get to like understand what people are doing, who they are. Um, I think the other thing that we really pride ourselves on is for our individuals who are remote, we set up welcome calls with them for everyone on the team. So they're not calls to just say like, oh, hi, I'm new, but it's really that bonding time to understand like, what are your hobbies? Tell me about your family. Like, what are your interests? And it's more about getting to know the person on a more like intimate level of who they are than just kind of the cookie cutter, like, oh, nice to meet you. And it's really a way to relate to people to understand like, what do you have in common? Because I think that what helps you feel like belonging a lot of times when you get some places, if you can find that commonality with someone and it's maybe not the person that's sitting next to you or across from you, but it could be the person that's in our instance, maybe working in California and you realize that you maybe have kids the same age or you played the same sports in high school or college or you like the same reality TV show. And from there, you're able to like build that relationship um, another thing that we do is we do monthly lunches and weekly lunches, actually, and I know that a lot of companies do that. Um, what we try to do, though, is make sure that we're all sitting in our kitchen together. So we have a huge long table in our kitchen and everyone just sits at the table and we kind of talk about what whatever, whatever we want to talk about that day. Like, and sometimes there's like smaller, like more cafe tables. And then there's a long table. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting at a table and we were all talking about different salad dressings. And we were like, we didn't know that we all liked salad so much. And it's such a random thing, but it's also something that like really can be a conversation starter later or something that you can be like, oh, I just tried this new salad dressing and I'm going to talk to this person about it because I know that they like that's something that they appreciate as well. So I think those are the things that we do to make sure as well as having two times a year outside of our holiday party, we do fly everyone in and we do an office outing and it's with our entire team. So we went to earlier this year, we went to Stowe, Vermont and there was a ski trip. And for those who didn't ski, you could get like, a spa service, but we all did like lunches together and dinners together. And we still did a lot of things as a team, even if you weren't say like, like myself, I'm not the most athletic person. So I chose to go to the spa. But before that, I like hung out with different people who were doing the treatment. So things like that, we just had a day where we all went to the beach together and we played like different games. Like we did an egg toss and we did like, um, I'm trying to think of everything we did because we did an egg toss. We did, um, what is it? Um, smash ball. I'm not like a beach ball, a beach game person, but we did a lot of beach games. I all games and stuff. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah that one. So we did that. We did cornhole. So a lot of different activities. And then there was just like time to just like relax on the beach too. So a fun day where some of the people who work in our like DC area, I talk to on the phone all the time, but I like literally hadn't met in person. So it was a really good time just to like connect and talk about different things. And then following up, be able to talk to them about like, oh my gosh, it was so good to see you. And it was so fun to figure out that like we had this in common. So I think those are the things that we do to make sure that people like really feel like they're included, but also belong in something like 
bigger than like what might be happening in your own home. Cause I think that when you're working remote, sometimes it's hard to get out and like, feel like you're a part of something. And I know I felt that in the beginning of COVID, I had worked and walked my office for like, you know, most of my adult career, I'd always gone into an office and then all of a sudden I was remote and I was like, this is so weird. Like I'm used to talking to people. I'm used to getting up and having a conversation. And I found that even like Skyping with people during the day and just being like, how's your day going? Or just saying like, oh, did you see this show yesterday? It really helps with like feeling like you're not alone and you're not kind of like in a like solitary by yourself. Absolutely. I think building those really meaningful moments of connection are important and thinking about how you're doing that throughout the year, throughout someone's entire employee experience from onboarding to exit interviews and from the candidate experience to being alumni of an organization as well. And I definitely agree kind of in creating those connections, you want to find commonalities, similar interests, uh, and see what you can can talk about inside and outside of work too. Uh, another piece of belonging, uh, you might not talk to the CEO every day, but you're talking to your manager on a pretty regular basis. What are the ways that you empower managers to really enable their teams, especially in a, a hybrid environment? I think being able to take action and have a voice. Um, I know that what I do personally, I do one-on-ones once a month with our um, recruiters as well as our account executives to understand like how they're doing, what's going well, um, if there's any areas that they may need help with. I know that our immediate managers are doing weekly one-on-ones with their team to understand kind of like level set on what's happening with the week, the day, what do they need, what are like their, what are they looking for in their career? And then we also look at doing, we do calls at the beginning of the week to kind of talk about like what's important to everyone and what do people need help with? And I think that the great thing is that managers know that they can, if they need something, they can just pick up the phone and call who they need to get there, or they can, you know, bring someone in from their team to say like, I'm going to need you to assist me in this. And it's not a question of, oh, I have to call this person to figure it out. It's really like always for us, it's people first. So it's what's going to be the best for that individual, what's going to be the best for that client. And then from there, being able to get to that like next level and being able for them to understand like in our organization, it's our co-founders, they all worked their way up. Like no one just was like hired into a CFO role or hired into a CEO, CEO role. They all worked their way up in previous organizations. So they understand how important it is for people to have the ability to make choices and to understand what their teams need and then to be able to take the time to make the right choices for their team without feeling like they need to ask 15 people to get to like the right answer. I think it's an idea of let's make mistakes. There's nothing that you're going to do that's going to like take the company down or, you know, people aren't going to work or want to work with us again. It's kind of like, go ahead and make those mistakes to figure out what works for you and your team. And if something goes wrong, we'll figure it out together. And it's a learning experience. It's not a, and that's what I love about our environment. It's not an environment where you're ever necessarily worried about making a mistake because if you can learn from what you're doing, that's going to be the most important thing. And I think that our leaders and managers feel that they don't, they feel very supported in what they're doing, but they know that if they need help or if something were to go awry, that they're going to have support and be able to get it right back on track. Absolutely. You want to make sure that you have that support. People feel empowered to have those collaborative conversations. And I want to talk about that people first mentality. You mentioned kind of really investing in the growth of the individual at the organization too, internal mobility and career pathing in addition to belonging uh, and feeling like your setup success in your current role is something that really keeps folks engaged. What are the ways that you encourage really that internal mobility? Um, And we know everybody has different goals. So those personalized career development tracks. I think it's truly understanding what's important to people, both personally and professionally. I think that um, I like to think that we all have a purpose, but everyone's purpose is different. So for us, it's really figuring out like, what is your purpose? Like, what is your reason for being? And then from there, figuring out like, 
How can we help you get to what's going to personally make you feel like you're fulfilling your purpose, but professionally, like what are going to be the routes that you can take to get there? And I think that it's interesting because some people don't know, you know, if you're new, if you're new in your career, you don't necessarily know like where you want to be in five years. Like, I think people ask that question. People are like, I want to still be employed. (laughs) Sometimes that's the answer, but I think it's kind of going through it together and saying, here are the different paths that you could have potentially have in front of you. What do you feel passionate about? And I think it's having those questions, those conversations about like, what are you passionate about? What excites you about this job? And then building a pathway from there. I know that like a lot of our leaders, we look at, okay, we know that these individuals have potential to do this next in their career, but let's make sure that's right. Or we know that in a couple of years, this person's probably going to be more interested in this based on where they're leading in their career or leaning. Okay, how do we help them? And for us, whenever anyone's promoted within our organization, they are also um, offered like development courses. So professional development is really important to us. And it's something that as an organization, we are covering. So it's not like, oh, it's great that like you're in this next level. And I know that a lot of companies, sometimes we promote people, but we don't know, are they good people managers? Are they, do they have what it takes to like make people like motivated to want to work for them and with them? And I think it's really important that we invest in that so that we can make sure that everyone feels good. You feel comfortable as a leader, but also the individuals who you're leading and working with feel comfortable collaborating and working with you. So for us, it's really important that we invest in career development courses and doing whatever the individual needs or wants or what they see is going to help them get to the next level. Because sometimes we're going to be more in tune with what we need than maybe someone else on the outside and kind of everything looks good. But I might say in myself, like, I know that like, I'm really not good with conflict resolution. So I'm going to take a course on that because I think that's something that like, I could benefit from, even though other people around me might not see that as something that would potentially be something that I could benefit from taking a course in that. Yeah, you really want to invest in people's professional development and also have those two-way kind of conversations in terms of what are you passionate about, being curious and really building something together in terms of a path to success as well. Uh, So I definitely agree with that too. And it sounds like Uh, There's really intentional ways to do that at Curate Partners as well. At the time of this recording, we are in the midst of National Hispanic Heritage Month and recognizing empowering Latinx employees is something that we should be doing 365 days a year. How is Curate Partners really celebrating uh, this month um, and really supporting the employees throughout the year? I think for us as an organization, we realize that social media is a pretty powerful source of information. And we like to use our platform to bring awareness to important causes as a means to show that we are educating ourselves and observing the month, as well as allowing our employees to feel seen, included, and recognized. I think for us, we really try to foster building relationship with different organizations and also trying to support minority and women-owned businesses, um, not only through some of our gifting throughout the year with our internal and external consultants, but also um, by working with and utilizing locally owned businesses. We do Um, weekly lunches with our team. And with that, we try to strive to make sure that we are supporting local businesses, especially um, with this being Hispanic Heritage Month. We worked and supported a locally owned Hispanic restaurant last week. And um, I know that our team was really enjoyed the food. It was definitely a crowd favorite. And I'm sure we'll be frequent customers with them moving forward. So I truly do believe for us, it's really just making sure that like we're not only educating ourselves but our team and making sure that we're not just saying things but truly living the actions and working with organizations to show our support. Yeah something that is thought about in an intentional way 365 days a year uh, throughout the organization. Natasha I know that I asked you really specific questions around your path uh, to people, talent, and culture, uh, what you're thinking about in terms of the strategy uh, to really engage uh, folks at Curate Partners as well. 
in terms of kind of a more open-ended question, what's the next problem or situation you're currently trying to solve? I think for us, it's just ensuring and continuing to make sure that our retention is very high. I think that it's really important to make sure that the people who are in your organization that are at the core, who have the knowledge, stay on and they feel such an important part of your team that they wouldn't want to leave, that people feel a part of the team, that people feel a part of our organization, that they know that they are supported, that they know that it's not just an organization that you're coming in and you're working every day and you're leaving, but in any job, I think that you know, we spend most of our time with the people we work with. So having an organization of people who wholeheartedly support you, who want to know who you are, who care about the things that you care about and your family and your personally and professionally, what you care about and what's important to you and organizations that have a mission that's in line with what your mission is for life, I think are all things that are really important. So I think for us, it's just maintaining our culture as we continue to grow is going to be the most important thing to us, like making sure that the people are continue to be at our core, because that's kind of what we were built on and based on and ensuring that everyone feels like this is a place that they can come and flourish in. Yeah, maintaining and kind of cultivating company culture in a hyper growth mode is also something that doesn't just happen. It really is, it needs to happen in a really meaningful way. And all the ways that we've talked about today as well. Natasha, is there anything also that I didn't ask that you want to share with folks who are listening or underscoring any kind of key takeaways you really hope people bring with them? I think it's just understanding that in the world that we live in now, it's so important to just continue to put the people that work for your organization first. I think that it's very easy sometimes to get caught up in like the profit and how are we doing? What what are we putting out there? But I think your people will speak for you. And if you're a great organization, that's going to be known and felt by the people who are working for you. So I think always just keeping your people at the core of everything you do, every decision you make is going to be the most important thing with not only our company growing, but any company that's successful and continuing to grow. I think that is a great note to cap off our conversation on. Natasha, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, and as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in employees and employers being seen, heard, and understood, and know it's a requirement for the business to really succeed overall. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. 